it's time to sit down and relax for the good, the bad, and the sequel Q&A with your host, Doug. Hey there, Doug here. Hope you're doing well. Hope you're staying safe. Next week's sequel, we're going to be covering Gremlins 2, those lovable creatures six years later. They made a sequel. And this is actually going to be like the second or third person that we interviewed that worked on this movie. Cast and director Glenn Daniels, uh, special effects maestro, the late, great Tim Lawrence, and this week's amazing guest, voiceover actor Neil Ross. So Neil's career is kind of different than other people's. He was a DJ, a disc jockey for years on like top, you know, 40 radio stations in Salt Lake City. And then not until he was like in his late thirties, he got into voice acting and his career is phenomenal. Everything from Transformers to GI Joe. Great story about John Rambo, the cartoon. Yes, they made a cartoon to that. Uh, Dick Tracy, Back to the Future Part 2, and a little cool story about working on Gremlins 2. You're going to love Neil. He has an amazing book. It's called Vocal Recall, A Life in Radio and Voiceovers. And what's really cool about it, net proceeds from the sale of the book, uh, he's going to be donating to the Broadcasters Foundation of America and the Actors Fund. And with everything going on, they could use uh, use a lot of help uh, during the times that we're in right now. And I'll put all the links uh, to his website, neilbook.com, uh, in the episode notes. So I'm going to shut up, and you're going to hear an amazing voice because he's a voice actor and former DJ, Neil Ross. It is. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Great, great. Thanks so much for taking the time. This will be a lot of fun. Sure. Looking great. Looking forward to it. Awesome, awesome. I love being able to hear about how people got started and – their lives before they obviously got into the entertainment world. So just like any good movie or TV show, it has a story and the story has a beginning. So where does your story begin? Where'd you grow up? Well, that's the $64 question. You know, when they say, where are you from? I was born in London, England. Oh, nice. During world war two. But, uh, when I was two years old, the war by then had ended and my father moved us to Canada, and we spent a little time in Toronto and then moved up to Montreal, and that's really where I spent my formative years was Montreal. Oh, wow, beautiful. And, and then just shortly before I turned 12, uh, the old the wanderlust hit the old man again, and off we went to California. And I spent a year and a half in Long Beach, and then we went down to San Diego. And that's where I finished. Uh, I did the last year of middle school. Junior high was what they called it back then. And then I did high school down there. And I, I kind of consider San Diego my hometown. But that's it's the rather complicated answer to your question. But that's fun, having the opportunity. When you moved to California, obviously that was kind of a culture shock. Was everyone asking you, like, whoa, what's it like over there? Because it's a totally new world when you're going from Canada, especially on the, you know, different weather for sure. Oh, absolutely. No, it was almost like going to the dark side of the moon. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not positive, but I don't, you know, I was a huge hockey fan. Uh, you know, you got to be in Montreal. Oh, yeah. And you I, don't think, I don't think they even announced the hockey results or put them in the newspaper. It was like nobody, you know, and of course now there's hockey teams up and down the West coast and it's a whole different world, but I I lost all of that. Um, And I I guess I, I write about it in my book, which we'll talk about at some point. Oh yeah. The, when I was in uh, middle school up in Canada, you had to wear a, a sport coat and tie to school. Uh, if you were a real rebel, you would ditch the sport coat and wear a sweater and tie, you know, those <laughs> <laughs> tough guy. Yeah. So my first uh, day at Franklin junior high in Long Beach, California, I'm strut into the place in my blazer and my tie. And everybody looks like they just walked off the set of rebel without a cause <laughs> or for younger listeners, uh, grease. You know, it's yeah. uh, black leather, black leather jackets and T-shirts with the sl- cigarettes rolled up in the sleeves and Levi's and 
construction boots, and that was just the girls. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they're looking at me like I'm, I'm from some strange planet. I actually had a couple of kids come up to me in the hall and ask if I was a teacher. <laughs> 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 They couldn't believe a student would dress like this. So needless to say that I only dressed like that one day. And then uh, I made a rapid adjustment in my wardrobe. And, uh, <laughs> you go home to your parents. You say, I need money. I need to dress like these other kids because it's not cutting. it." <laughs> and uh, then we started out on a sports theme. Uh, I'm, and I'm looking at all these guys shooting hoops, you know. And I, it's like. In Canada, in those days, basketball was something the girls played uh, in the gym because they were too cowardly to come out in sub-zero weather and play. Hockey. Yeah. <laughs> so wow. I'm, I'm looking at these guys dunking baskets and I go, why are they playing this girls game? You know, I had, uh, <clears throat> I honestly didn't know that guys played basketball. Wow, look at that. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it was kind of a, a little bit of a culture shock. So in high school, what were some things that you were into, Neil? Like, uh, what are some things once you got acclimated to the, the weather and the people? What did you do growing up there? Oh, I guess I had this, uh, this normal, semi-normal uh, adolescence. I really, I, I didn't have any direction in life whatsoever. The only thing that, there is a thread to everything that happened to me. I should probably back up and say that. From the age of about five or six, I began compulsively doing, uh, imitating voices and accents that I heard on the radio, not with any thought of turning it into a profession. It was no just way. something that was, yeah, it was just something fun to do. And uh, I remember my dad bringing a tape recorder home from the office. And in those days, you know, uh, not many people owned tape recorders. I mean, this thing was the size of a suitcase and probably <laughs> cost a fortune. But he let me record some stuff, and that was the first time I ever heard a a playback of my efforts. <laughs> That's so cool. I was, I was rather pleased with myself. Anyway, uh, shortly before we left Canada, I had, I had never really been a fan of music up to that point. All the uh, 50s pop stuff did nothing for me, classical. I, I just never heard any music that really excited me. And then one day in the kitchen of a friend's house, uh, suddenly this song comes on the radio. And I mean, I felt this jolt of electricity from the tips of my toes to the top of my head. I'd never heard anything like this. I instantly fell in love with it. And it was uh, Little Richard singing Tutti Frutti. Yes, nice. And I, I had fallen in love with this uh, the sound of the singer and this incredible Norland's uh, musicianship. And I instantly became a rock and roll fan, uh, which led me to start listening to music on the radio, which is something I've never really done before because I didn't like what I heard. And uh, that led me to try to discover stations that would play this stuff. And of course, when we moved out to California, uh, Shortly after we, we got out here, uh, a station uh, called KFWB flipped its format to Top 40, and uh, it, was a, it was a sensation. And suddenly here was this radio station that played this kind of music uh, round the clock, and I was thrilled. And then in San Diego, we, I discovered a couple more stations that did it, and I, I really began to listen to radio a lot. And over time, I began to focus on what happened in between the records, uh, the DJs, the things they said, the things they did. And uh, one night I had this uh, epiphany and I thought to myself, God, I wonder if I could do that. <laughs> you know, and at the age of 15, I suddenly knew what I wanted to do. Uh, I mean, it was just all laid out there for me. I got to be on the radio. Instead of singing in the shower, you were singing the call sign, KFWB. <laughs> well, it's, uh, you know, if I'd had the kind of drive and talent uh, that in the direction of being a musician, I would have done that. 
<clears throat> but it was just it was just hopeless. I, I couldn't master any musical instrument or sing, so I couldn't be in a band. So I guess part of the way to you know get into the sort of be a part of the rock scene was to be a DJ and play the, the music on the radio as opposed to being in a band. Wow. Yeah, so, so when that, did you start pursuing that, being a DJ? Well, of course, what do you do at 15? And uh, eventually what I did was I, in desperation, I put together a little uh, studio in the garage and started trying to teach myself how to do this. Cool. And then I got... I got very lucky. I happened to meet a radio guy and he gave me a lot of wonderful advice. And uh, eventually when I got out of high school, I took off for New York to go to a, a broadcasting school. Oh, cool. Where at? We're in the city. It, it was, as I recall, down in the village, it was RCA Institutes. I'm sure they're long gone. Yeah, probably. It sounds good. Yeah, it's kind of in the village area. Nice. Down there. Yeah. And then uh, what I had to do was, uh, as my radio mentor told me, you've got to find a station either desperate enough or dumb enough to give you that first job. <laughs> and uh, I did. And I asked the fellow later, why was I chosen after all the many other applicants you must have had? And he said, you were the only guy who would work for minimum wage. <laughs> <laughs> Where was it at? Uh, that was in Salt Lake City, Utah. Wow. So then it took you back to from New York and then to Salt Lake. Yeah. Well, I took a, a, a I hitched a ride uh, out of New York that sort of put me in Salt Lake and I, I was stranded there for a little while. So I just went around and applied uh, for work at every station in town. And a few months later, one of them called and said, come on up. You got the job. Uh, cool. That was the beginning. What kind of radio station was it? What did it play? It was, it was a little uh, 250 watt top 40 station. You know, we played the hits and, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I announced them in my, my, my 18 year old voice. <laughs> and that was, that was the beginning. And, that is so uh, cool. and that, that, a rather circuitous route led me into voiceovers after a certain point, which we yeah, can talk about or not. Yeah, how long did that take? So I'm guessing when you got, how old were you when you got the job in Salt Lake? Like 21, 22? No, I I was 18. Oh, you were 18, so you did it right after school. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. The, the, the school was only about six months. So, okay. Yeah, just after my 18th birthday was my first radio gig. So from that, how long until you got into voiceover work and how'd you get started doing that? It was quite a while. I actually spent uh, 20 years in radio, oh, uh, wow. although the voiceover and the radio sort of overlapped at a certain point. <clears throat> but, but what happened was I did little voices and characters on the air, sometimes in commercials uh, with varying amounts of success. And then uh, Somewhere around in the early 70s, I discovered that there was this business called voiceovers. I'd never heard of it. I had wondered who these people were who were voicing the television commercials that I would hear and some of the national radio commercials and who were the people who narrated the documentaries and who were the people that provided voices for animation. And But I didn't know. I, I had a working theory that they were on camera people moonlighting on the side it never occurred to me that this was a business unto itself. But one day I was talking to a record promoter from Los Angeles and he just spit out the, the word voiceover or the contraction voiceover. Yeah. And I said, dare, scarcely daring to, to hope, I said, what is that? And he said, oh, it's, you know, commercials, cartoons, promos, voiceovers. And I suddenly discovered there were people up there who did nothing but that and that they had agents and that it was a whole, a whole thing in Los Angeles in those days. It was basically either LA or New York that it wasn't going on anywhere else in those yeah. days. So at that point I put on this full court press to try to, to try to get up to LA and get in the business. And it took me a, a, another 10 years to make it happen, but that was the goal. So do you remember like the first gig that you got doing voiceovers? 
Yeah, the first success I had was uh, narrating these sales presentations for a, a chap. They would uh, they would only be seen and heard by a room full of salesmen. Yeah, but but it was work. Oh yeah, and, uh, yeah, and um, you know, little by little, I wormed my way in. Uh, in animation, I did uh, a, a fair amount of coming in and just doing, you know, a, a, an incidental character who only appears in one episode, kind of thing. Yeah, but but that was great. It, it, you know, it was like a, a young on camera actor who who does bit parts and just kind of learns how it all works and watch watches the uh, the stars and how they operate. And I mean, I, I remember the first time I got into Hanna-Barbera and um, just doing like six or eight lines as a pushy salesman who gets his tie stuck in the door. But my God, there I was with uh, the, the Joni Gerber and Lenny Weinrib and Michael Bell. I mean, these people were like, you know, the Clark Gables and Vivian Lees of voiceovers. I couldn't believe I was in the room with them. <laughs> so, you know, it was, a, it was a really exciting moment. Yeah. And you were like a fan of it too. So that's pretty cool that you, when you were in that room, you, you understand like the moment and the opportunity that you had to be in there with them. That's very neat. Yeah. No, I have been hearing about these people for a long time. Um, uh, so yeah, just just to get to watch them work and see how they did it uh, was was fascinating to me and uh, and and a huge thrill. Yeah, and then like you said, you had like the little parts. Like IMDb is never one hundred percent, but it has like a couple episodes of Spider Man. Uh, what else? Mork and Mindy. You had did some additional mm-hmm. voices on that, and then in nineteen eighty three, the Dukes, the cartoon. Yes, that was, um, I think I did the same thing more or less on Mork and Mindy that I did on uh, the Dukes. Oh, okay. Uh, Hanna-Barbera, they, they had this thing they would do if they did a cartoon version of a an on-camera television show. They would have the characters go around the world. Yeah. Uh, they, knew, they knew that I could do various accents. So they would call me and I would be a Greek uh, restaurant owner or something like that. And uh, so, yeah, I, uh, I actually, the, the, it's funny, the only time I worked with the full cast was the first time. Then they would just bring me in and I would do my lines and isolate it. But the time I showed up, it wasn't uh, the two guys, I'm forgetting their names, Tom Wolpat and the other chap. Uh, Schneider, I think it was the two guys they brought in when when the regular guys went on strike. Oh. <laughs> so I never met the actual Dukes; I just met the Ringers. <laughs> <laughs> but I got to meet Denver Pyle. I don't know if you know; he was a wonderful character actor. He was in the Dukes of Hazard. Oh yeah, uh, nice. I don't know if you do you remember. Uh, I remember the show. Yeah, my my yeah, my dad used to have me watch. We watched a lot of TV Land growing up. Well, if you, I don't know if you've ever seen Bonnie and Clyde. The, oh yeah, Warren, yeah. Well, he played the uh, Frank Hammer. The, oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The lawman who they humiliate and then he tracks them down. A renowned character actor, and I'll never forget. You know, I walk in and they all know each other, and I'm a total stranger, and I'm just kind of standing there, and he walked over shook my hand, gave me a big smile and said, how are you doing? I'm Denver Pyle. And I thought, God, what a nice thing to do. You know, well, I'm, you know, whoever I am and <laughs> very nice to meet you. But I, I never forget that. He was very gracious. That's really cool. Now, do you do that when you walk in? Do you shake the hand and do, a, do that kind of voice like he did? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you know, I, I if somebody looks out of place, I will try to make to see if they can be helped or made to feel more welcome or, you know, whatever seems appropriate. So here's a question that I had for you, but it's great that you brought it up that they had you, you're the hired hand to uh, do all the voices around the world. Now, back then, how do you learn all those different accents? Nowadays, if somebody's an up and coming, they want to do voices and they get a script for, Hey, you got to do this kind of accent. They can go on YouTube and watch videos over and over again. But how did you mm-hmm. get all those accents down back then? Uh, it just sort of 
seem to happen all, more or less by osmosis. I think I sort of had this all-purpose European accent. It, it wasn't really anything. I think oh, okay. I was imita- I think I was imitating uh, Anthony Quinn in Zorba the Greek, which is another movie you probably never saw. No, never heard of it. But, yeah. <laughs> Oh, it was a wonderful movie, but it's it's been forgotten. But and of course, Anthony Quinn was uh, Irish Mexican, but he sort of had this face where he could play almost any ethnic character, and uh, and he played Zorba the Greek. And I, I I think I was doing him when I when I did that. It was mostly watching movies and television, and you just imitate what you're hearing because uh, cool. it's fun. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Now, did you have a recorder when you had practiced, like your your dad brought home? Obviously, it was a lot smaller, but did you have that when you were practicing voices before you went in for an audition? Oh, sure, absolutely. Uh, of course, you know, in, in most cases, when you go into audition, you don't have a clue what you're going to be reading. Oh, really? Oh, man. No, you don't. You don't find out till you get there. So you kind of got to do it in the green room. But uh, at one point in the uh, mid to late 80s, when I was really blessed and to be very successful, I had so many recurring characters in different shows that I had to carry a little tape recorder around with me with samples of each one of them. And I would sit in the parking lot before I went into the studio and I would queue up the character I was going to do next. And I would listen to it over and over again to lock it in, you know, before I went into the session. And, it makes uh, a lot of sense because they could probably bleed. If you were you know, doing the voice from uh, Clyde from Pac-Man and then you're going to go do Shipwreck an hour later, mm-hmm. you know, it could yeah. bleed into each other. So I know that's a good idea that you have that. Yeah. 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 I still have that cassette. After all these that years. is awesome. Yeah. I still got it sitting in a corner somewhere. Now, during what show, when did you feel that you had that moment like, wow, this is something I could really do for a living? Well, what happened was I got involved with a radio station in San Diego. And we started doing this comedy series. And it was basically just three of us. Uh, there, uh, There was a woman who played all the women in it. And then there was the, uh, another fellow who, who basically played the lead role. And I played everybody else. And we did 75 episodes of this thing. And over the course of, of doing that, I must have done 20 or more characters. And I began thinking, I, I wonder if I, if, if I could do this like on a, in the big time. And I would... Uh, sit and watch uh, the cartoons on Saturday morning and I would listen to what those people were doing. And then I would try to evaluate, uh, you know, see if I was even slightly competitive. And of course I was down in San Diego at this point. So there was nobody I could go to and say, you know, is this good enough? Cause they wouldn't have known, you know, there wasn't any cartoon work happening down there. And um, I guess Probably the first inkling I had that I had a shot was when I had a, an appointment with an agent in Los Angeles, and he listened to my animation reel, and he liked it. He said, this is good. I can work with this. And I thought, Phew. okay, maybe I got something here. That's and then, cool. you know, the first first few jobs, you show up, and you're just waiting for somebody to go, who is this guy? He's just some jumped-up disc jockey. He's no good. Get him out of here. <laughs> You know, it didn't happen, but uh, it, it took me, I don't know, I've, probably the, the thing that really put me over the top was when I got the, uh, the the role in Voltron. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, I, I got the role of Keith and the role of Pidge in, in Voltron, and we did 125 of those. Wow. And uh, by... by by the time we were about halfway through, I started thinking, I think I got a handle on this stuff now. Yeah. You know? When you're doing these, obviously, I know when you said you had six or eight lines, you're kind of there. And then, but, but how many, how does it usually work? Are you doing like one episode a day when you're there, when you're like one of the leads on the show? Or how does that, how, how does the timing of an episode go? 
Um, it it tended to vary. Most shows would would do uh, one episode a week, and you'd come in, and that's all you'd work on is the one episode. Uh, one show I worked on, they they would do two a day. Uh, they moved pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, but ge- generally, they're only you're only going to do one episode in each session. So from that, all the voices that you're doing over the years, one that really caught my eye, and it was a show that I, I don't know how I accidentally stumbled across it. I didn't watch it. I was born in 86, but I watched a lot of older mm-hmm. things like growing up. But uh, you're the voice of John Rambo on Rambo, which was a kid's yeah. cartoon, which is yeah. very fascinating that you could take a character like Rambo and have it as a kid's cartoon. Yeah, well, that was a very uh, a controversial show. Um, in fact, I, I mentioned it in my book. I was looking at, uh, do, do you remember uh, the show Siskel and Ebert at the movies? Yeah. Well, I'm watching that. I used to enjoy that show. And suddenly, in the middle of the show, one of them starts talking about, you know, they're going to make a cartoon out of Rambo. Oh, yes, I heard about that. Unconscionable. How dare they? This is you know, an outrage. And I'm thinking, this is a show about movies, and they're talking about a television show, which neither one of them has even seen, but they know it's bad. <laughs> and then one of them says, and this Sylvester Stallone, hasn't he made enough money? Well, of course, Sylvester Stallone had nothing to do with this cartoon show. Uh you know, he owns the Rocky character that he created, but Rambo was created by somebody else. And when he appeared in those films, he was an actor for hire like anybody else. And as I said, he had no involvement in the cartoon show whatsoever. And here was Siskel and Ebert ripping him a new one on national television. And I thought, God, don't you guys do your homework? And, uh, you know, there were various other groups that were against it and, uh, the show itself was laughably nonviolent. I mean, they were so, uh, you know, nervous about the, all the feedback they were getting that they they, they really created a, a, a. There was less violence in Rambo than a lot of other shows. <laughs> I it, bet. It's funny, but uh, yeah, and uh, I tell a story in the book, uh, true story. I was uh, I had some time in between jobs and I was in Hollywood. And so I walk it up Hollywood Boulevard. There used to be a bunch of bookstores there. And sometimes if I had time to kill, I'd go in a bookstore and see what was what. So I'm walking up Hollywood Boulevard and I I suddenly I hear a, a PA system going and I realize across the street, somebody is getting a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. And it turned out it was Richard Crenna who played Colonel Troutman in the Rambo movie. Oh, yeah. and I realized, oh, yes, the next the next Rambo movie is coming out. So, of course, they would give him the star now. And then I hear the MC. He says, uh, oh, wait a minute, ladies and gentlemen. I see a big limousine coming down Hollywood Boulevard. There might be a really big star in there. Let's Let's see who's in that limousine. And I thought, oh, my God, I bet he's here. And sure as hell, the limousine stops and out gets Sylvester Stallone. And he looks like a million bucks. Tan, the hair is perfect. The suit is perfect. He's waving to the crowd. And I'm thinking, isn't this ironic? The on-camera Rambo is across the street and the cartoon Rambo is on the other (laughs) side of the street. And just as I think that, I feel somebody tugging my sleeve. And I turn around and there's this poor wino and he's tugging on my shirt going hey you got any spare change <laughs> and i'm fumbling around in my pocket and i'm thinking this shows me where i stand on the show business ladder <laughs> 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 the on-camera rambo arrives in a limousine <laughs> in a thousand dollar suit i'm across the street leaning on a parking meter getting panhandled by a wino <laughs> but <laughs> that is oh. great yeah <laughs> So how did you do? How do how do you come up the voice for that? Do you watch the movie and just try to do it, or you just well, wait I, on it? That's another that's another funny story. I get in there and they say, okay, uh, before you do anything, we want you to know we do not want 
a Sylvester Stallone sound alike. And I said, okay, understood. And then as a joke to sort of soften him up, I said, all right, let me read the first line for you here. And we'll get started. And, you know, and, and instead of laughing, they said, that's great. <laughs> that's just what we want. And I said, I thought you didn't want a Sylvester Stallone sound alike. They said, that doesn't sound like Sylvester Stallone. I said, you're absolutely right. Because <laughs> I'm no dummy. Yeah, right. And oh so, my uh, God. as I point out in the book, some of my uh, best uh, jobs have come as a result of failed impressions. So I thought I was doing <laughs> Sylvester Stallone, but apparently it was so bad they didn't think it was, and, and somehow they ended up picking me. And so that's how I got to be Rambo. That is awesome. Yeah, I, we've we've talked about a couple on the podcast because we do we talk about movie sequels, and we did one of his sequels for a, a movie I, he had come out last year, Escape Plan Three, and. Uh, I did probably the worst like during it when I was talking about him, I did like the worst Stallone impersonation ever, but (laughs) so, so right now would be a good point. So let's talk about your book a little bit. It's at neilbook.com, right? Yes. N E I L B O O K.com. Yeah. And I'll put the link in the bio too. Yeah. You can also find it on, uh, on Amazon. The title is vocal recall, a subtitle, a life in radio and voiceovers. And it's available in print, Kindle, and audio. Audio, and, uh, that's perfect. Yeah, and uh, by strange coincidence, I'm the narrator. <laughs> it'd be uh, it'd be really bad if you weren't for some reason. Well, I I there was a highly competitive audition, but I, and I just uh, but I managed to get it. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, man, that's the only book I've ever read. Uh, my hat goes off to the people that do books on tape or whatever they call it now, because that's hard work. I, I almost fired myself three times <laughs> while I was recording this book, you know. And I think one one thing that's really cool about your book is that you're donating uh, to the Broadcasters Foundation of America and the Actors Fund. Yeah, I well, I I really didn't write the book to make money, and so far my plan is working perfectly. But uh, <laughs> should there should there be a profit, yes, that's going to go to uh, the Broadcast Foundation and the Actors Fund. Well, that's cool. What made you think to write a book? That was kind of a cir- circuitous thing. I did an appearance with um, Rob Paulson. Uh, who's probably best known for Animaniacs. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> and, of course, and uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Anyway, he he does a, a, a podcast uh, called Talkin' Tunes, and he also occasionally takes it uh, live. So he did one of these at uh, the uh, one of the comedy clubs in Los Angeles, uh, the Improv. Oh, sweet. And... Yeah, and I went down there, and uh, I was—I had—I was a little nervous. I, you know, I'm not used to being in front of an audience, but it just went great. And I started thinking about maybe writing a monologue and trying to book myself into places. So I started writing this monologue, and uh, you know, it just got completely out of hand. And at a certain point, uh, scarcely daring to, to to even think it possible, I suddenly realized, you know what? You're writing a book, and. Uh, uh, some, you know, I never thought I was, would, would ever be able to do something like that. But you did it. But the only reason I, I managed to do it was a, rather than focusing on writing a book, I just focused on writing a, a chapter at a time. And, you know, you do that often enough, you, you end up with a book. Yeah. Was it fun, like, taking that trip down memory lane? Because when you actually write things down and actually put in some kind of order, you're like, oh, yeah, I remember that. Yes, there were some epiphanies. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I was not, most of authors that I've read about when they talk about their work habits, you know, they carve out a three or four hour period during the day. And that's when they write. And, you know, I don't care if the world is exploding, leave me alone. I'm writing. <laughs> uh, I, I wasn't like that. I would think of a chapter and then I would just think about it for days on end, maybe a week, maybe 10 days. 
And when I would finally hit critical mass, uh, I would lunge for the for the computer and just type like a maniac and get it down as quickly as I could before it evaporated. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you know, th- th- there's there's a wonderful moment. I, I mentioned falling in love with rock and roll music and Little Richard's uh, song. And then toward the end of the book, I actually meet Little Richard. Oh, that's awesome. And I had almost forgotten about that. And I was in the middle of thinking about this chapter, and I suddenly thought, oh, my God, of course, and I met him. God, you've got to put that in, you idiot. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, that's cool. So, so I'll put the link for those listening. The link will be in the episode notes, so you can be able to find out where to find it on Amazon or at neilbook.com. Everything will be in there, so you can just click on it, and uh, you can read it. Lots of interesting stories. Yeah, what, as soon as we get through here, I'll get get on the uh, computer and I'll email you uh, links and things. And awesome. Yeah. So you've done. I wrote it down before, and I'm sure not of all of them could be on there, but over 259 credits. So obviously, we can't sit here because we if we went through all of them. We'd be here for weeks. But a few that really stick out to me growing up is, uh, of course. G.I. Joe, Transformers, Voltron. And one movie I loved growing up, and me and my daughter, after I talked to you a few weeks ago, uh, I looked at your IMDb and I'm like, oh man, an American tale. So me and my daughter, she's 13 months. So obviously she's not going to remember that moment. But uh, it was cool watching that again because I haven't watched it in years. Yeah, that was a a marvelous, uh, lucky stroke to get in that movie. It... um... You know, people have kind of forgotten about it, but up until that point, animation, movie animation had kind of died. You know, Disney would do something once in a blue moon. Uh, Other than that, it would be Hanna-Barbera. They might make a movie out of one of their TV shows, but it would only show on weekends at theaters, you know. Uh, there really wasn't much going on in animation. That's true. And then, and then along came Don Bluth, and he did The Secret of Nim, and then he got uh, uh, he teamed up with Steven Spielberg, uh, Spielberg producing, and they came up with the idea for this movie. And it came out, and it doesn't sound like much today, but remember, this was a long time ago. It it did about fifty million domestically, That's a lot. which was astonishing for an animated uh, feature. People couldn't believe it, and then uh, that gave uh, uh, Spielberg the the impetus to go ahead and do Who um, Framed Roger Rabbit, and that was a huge hit. And then this whole cascade of animated uh, movies started to happen, and it's still going on today. But really, an American tale kick-started all of that, as far as I'm concerned. No, it seems that way. When you think about those movies, like you, we just got uh, Disney Plus, and you look at some of the eras of the, because they have them in like decades, and Mm Disney-wise in the 70s, it was pretty like thin when it comes to the movies that were actually like hits or very popular. It's when they did like some of like the Robin Hood uh, ones like that. No, that's true. And then All Dogs Go to Heaven came out after that. So you're right. Look at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And our, it, it, it's also uh, quaint now. Uh, you know, I had a home studio, but it, I never did anything professionally. It was, it was strictly for editing demos and practicing. And it was on reel-to-reel tape, you know. <laughs> and uh, my agent called, and she said they, uh, they're casting a movie. They want uh, the voice of a drunken mouse. And I said, okay, well, uh, send me the script. She said, well, there is no script. They just want you to make something up. And I got all pissy. I said, you know, they can't even give me a script. What kind of nonsense is this? And I didn't. I was. I was not. I wasn't even going to do it. <laughs> and finally, after a couple of days, I said, oh, what the hell? 
and uh, they, they said he's a, a drunken Tammany Hall style politician. And <laughs> so I just threaded up a tape and I made up a, a drunken uh, speech, you know, about 35, 40 seconds and uh, rewound the tape, didn't even listen to it, threw it in a bag, took it to the post office. You know, nowadays we'd send an MP3 and it would all be over in uh, 30 seconds. But no, I, I I had to mail this thing <laughs> to them. And then to my absolute uh, amazement, I got the job. It was, uh, and as I said, I almost didn't, didn't bother to audition for it. So. Good thing you did, because then you worked with them again later on, right? Well, I did. And of course, your show deals with sequels yeah and the biggest sequel i was ever part of was uh again this was a a spielberg produced movie uh back to the future part two yeah i was the voice of the uh, biff tannen museum yeah i love that part (laughs) yeah that was that that, it's that's a nice credit to have and i don't know how i got that job as i recall uh, they assigned that to me i don't think i auditioned for it and how they stumbled across me, I don't know, because the only thing they knew about me was this guy who did the drunken mouse, <laughs> you know, and I don't know how they would say, hey, that's the perfect guy for the Biff Tannen Museum. So how it happened, I, I, I don't know. I don't when you were talking biggest sequel, I thought you were going to mention Gremlins too. Well, there's Gremlins too. Yeah, I, I somehow <laughs> I think, I, yeah. That, that 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 maybe uh, Back to the Future is a little bigger than that. I don't know, but yeah, <laughs> Gremlins too. I was in that, and in fact, in Gremlins too, I played uh, a talking men's room. A talking uh, men's room. Oh, that that was you. Yeah. Oh, I thought it was you. Hey, just one of the TV. Welcome it. to the men's room. Remember that? Yeah. Did yeah. Did somebody forget to wash his hands? <laughs> oh, that's so great. You know, it's funny, yeah. subliminally, I watched that movie a lot as a kid, and mm-hmm. uh, we there was a science fair I had in like third or fourth grade, and I made something that was kind of a ripoff of that. That's really funny, because I watch that movie all the time. That's really cool. Is there any other movies? I, I see Dick Tracy on here. So many cool mm-hmm. little things that you did over the years that were memorable. Yeah, Dick Tracy, uh, that's my one on-camera appearance. It lasts about a second and a half. I was uh, the green newsman. There were four newsmen. They were the, the whole movie was primary colors. Yeah, the beginning part, right when they talk about like, or when Dick I Tracy is framed. Yeah, I think it's around that time. It's been a while since I've seen the movie. That's a Some great of movie. Some of what I did made it in as voiceovers, but there there's a couple of moments where you see me. And um, that's my entire on camera. <laughs> that's cool. What was that like when you when they're like, Oh, you're gonna stand there, Neil? You're like, Oh no, I don't that's not what I do. I stand behind here. <laughs> that's cool. Uh well, I you know, as I as I say, uh I was, I'm only visible in this movie for a second and a half, but I got a whole chapter out of it for the book. <laughs> if you're curious what it's like to be on the set of a major motion picture, well, I have done that and I can, and it's, it's in there and there's a whole chapter about it because I was there for 12 hours and they wrote these long speeches for us. And I did three or four takes on each one. I mean, I, I walked out of there thinking I was going to star in this thing, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, you know, I'm I'm just thrilled that I got in there at all. So uh, yeah, that's amazing. Just as I was leaving, Warren Beatty did the nicest thing that just about anybody's ever done for me. But you got to buy the book to read about it. Okay, buy the book. Listen, listen to the man, Warren Beatty stories. <laughs> yeah. So so you're still doing this now, and just I'm looking up and down before we chatted. I took a bunch of notes and just looking at all the different shows, like all the Marvel, you know, you were on, you did voices on Batman, Star Wars. And then over the years, just so many different series, uh, like Zorro. It seems like a lot of these series, 20, 30 episodes, the mask, which I didn't even know that was a cartoon. Yeah. It's a, it's a shame because I, 
<clears throat> as I, I mentioned in the book, Rob Paulson actually played the, the lead character in that. Oh, cool. And he was brilliant. They would write him these page long monologues and they left it up to him to, as to which voices and accents he would do. And he would just rip through this thing, changing voices, changing accents, throwing in ad libs that frequently were better than what was written. <laughs> and I mean, he would finish one of these and we would all just spontaneously applaud the whole cast. That is awesome. It was, it was just genius. I, you know, Rob is one of these guys that I, I pinch myself. I can't believe I get to be in the room with him. He's so wonderful. What was the first um, time you got to work with him? Was it on that or? Geez, that's a good question. Um, I, I don't remember. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure I knew him before we started doing the mask, but I just don't remember from where. Sorry. No, it's okay. So, I'm sure you had that. Re- it's cool. No matter what, you still have that relationship that yeah. not too long ago, we invited you on talk live in front of people and talk shop, which is pretty cool. Yeah. No, he's a wonderful guy. He's a very generous guy. He's well, you know, 99.9% of the voiceover people are like that. It's, it's a really nice group or at least was back in the day. I'm, I'm not as active now and, I don't see that many people, so I don't know what's going on in the trenches these days. Yeah. But back in the day, I mean, people were so damn generous and friendly and warm and welcoming. Uh, people would come in out of the on camera world and watch us and say, y- you people are just so different from on camera people. Like, apparently on camera people can be pretty nasty towards each other. I've heard. Yeah. But uh, voiceover people, just the nicest, friendliest, warmest, uh, you know, Frank Welker, who's, uh, you know, you talk about my 200 and how, however many credits, he, he's up around 800 or 900. Yeah, I'm sure, yeah. <laughs> and honest to God, Frank is the most self-effacing uh, guy you'll ever meet. Uh, we, we, had the, we had the same agent, and she would tell me, she said, I get so damn mad at him. I call him up and I say, okay, Frank, you got a job. They want you to do blah, blah, blah. And he go, you know, I don't really I'm not that great. You know who they should hire is so-and-so. She said, well, so-and-so <laughs> isn't with this agency. You are. Go do the job. You know, <laughs> he immediately thinks about giving the job to somebody else. It's, uh, I don't know. The, the, the voice people back in those days and hopefully still today, uh, some of the nicest people you'll ever meet. Oh, no, that's awesome. So one thing I like to ask people towards the end is uh, a few things. Do you have like a favorite voice that you did over the years that I'm sure people, you know, you, you recently been going to any of those comic cons and meeting folks that admired your work over the years? Oh, yeah, I do quite a few appearances, have done quite a few appearances, still do. Uh, my favorite the characters probably are the are the two characters that people seem to reference the most, and that would be Shipwreck in G.I. Joe and Springer in Transformers. Um, and then I have a secret favorite in a show that nobody remembers anymore, which is called Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. Oh, I love that. I love the movie. I remember the show. Yeah, well, I played uh, the newsman, uh, Whitley White, who was in love with the sound of his own voice. <laughs> and uh, I sort of modeled him after a bombastic uh, newscaster that was uh, popular in L.A. for quite a while. And uh, I just loved playing that part. And the, and the scripts were so well written that uh, most of the time while I was doing one of his speeches, I'd be this close to cracking myself up. <laughs> it never it never actually happened but i was always just this close to losing it because i was having so damn much fun that's awesome one thing that's pretty cool on here is john astin was on that show yes he was oh that's really yeah. awesome yeah that was anyway that way it was wonderful to uh to meet him and get to work with him the sweetest man lovely man <laughs> that and is I, so awesome some years later, I worked, I did a voiceover on a sitcom and, and John was on the show and 
they we had a studio audience, you know, uh, and they introduced John and these people went nuts. I mean, he got a standing ovation from this uh, this crowd. And I was so happy for him, you know. Uh, a lot of people remember him warmly f- from the shows that he's done. And uh, as I said, he's a lovely man. I I enjoyed getting to know him. That's awesome. Yeah, who didn't love? Who doesn't love Adam's family? That's such a great show. No. Yeah, yeah. And now I think I know the answer to this one. But if you didn't make that foray into voiceover where well, you made a career of doing it for you know 40 something years what what do you think you would have done still been on the radio or was there any other passions that you had none that i'm aware of no i think if i hadn't uh segued into voiceovers my story would have had a very sad ending because the radio <laughs> business has really gone gone to hell in the handbasket since they deregulated it in 1996 and all these huge corporations came in and bought all the stations and paid too much money for them. And now they're just firing people left, right, and center. I'm sure I'd have been kicked out of the business years ago. (laughs) uh, So no, I'm, I'm so happy that I persevered and and got into the voiceover business. Yeah. And so many people are glad that you did it. It's cool that you go to those conventions. I talked to, I interviewed a guy that uh, was the voice of Beast on X-Men, the animated series. Uh And he never went to those conventions. And I'm sure you know this too, is when you do the voiceovers, you really don't know how much it affects people. Maybe on a TV show you're on, you walk down the street, somebody says, oh my God, I love you in blank. But just like you said, when you saw Sly across the street, the the voice of Rambo was kind of leaning against the parking meter and the other Rambo yeah. was coming out of a limo, but he went yeah. to one for the first time. They had like an X-Men reunion and he couldn't, Im- he couldn't imagine in a million years, just the response people were like, Oh, I watched you growing up and helped me get through such hard times. So that's gotta be really cool meeting fans. Yeah, we get, we get that quite a bit, especially with, uh, with GI Joe, you, you'll, you'll talk to somebody and they'll tell you a story about how they had a really miserable childhood, bad parenting and, and that the only way they picked up any sort of uh, morality or, or ethics was off, off of GI Joe and those public service announcements that were in there. And, uh, and these are people who've gone on to have successful careers in, in law enforcement, the military, or you name it. And, 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 you know, they tell you these stories, and oh my God, I'm close to tears. And uh, we had no idea that we had, we had this kind of influence on people, I'm, I'm, you know. And uh, so it's very, very gratifying. And... Uh, yeah, I, I, I had sort of resisted going to these until 2011, and then I, somebody talked me into doing a BotCon in Pasadena. And uh, the reaction from the fans was just unbelievable. I, I was astonished. It's, uh, it's like getting to be a movie star for a weekend, you know? Yeah, you're, you're probably uh, like, is there somebody standing behind me? Why are all these people yeah. so excited? Well, I remember we were going to sign autographs, Greg Berger and I, and we walked out and there's this gigantic line going all the way to the horizon. And I said, what are they in line for? And they said, they're in line for you guys. I said, you're kidding. I couldn't believe it. That Uh, is so cool, Neil. That was, that's awesome. It's really cool. I'm, I'm really happy that we connected and I was able to talk to you and everybody check out his book. I'll have the link in the notes. It's really cool what you're doing and uh, your career has been amazing. I'm happy I was able to pick your brain for an hour. Well, I've, I've really enjoyed it, Doug. Uh, I've had, I've had a good time. Thank you for inviting me on the show. I appreciate it. No, thanks for taking the time. And uh, so I saw one thing before I let you go that I thought was pretty cool. Did you just do the voice, the announcer voice on pressure luck last year? Yeah. Yeah. And I'll be back again uh, this year. It's coming back. Sweet. Yeah, I know. I love when yeah. they do the summer of, uh, they bring back all those old game shows. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We're, we're, uh, they're going to do 12, uh, this, this, this year, last year it was eight. Oh, cool. Well, that so, should be fun. 
Sure. Yeah. Awesome, man. Well, thank you, Neil. Have a great rest of your night. And thanks again for taking the time. Okay, Doug. Thank you. It's been good talking to you. Wasn't Neil amazing? Just the voices. I love voice actors because they're able to do so much. Like we talked about it. his credits are like 259 credits and just so many memorable things. And, and like I said, when I was talking to him, as soon as uh, we talked about American Tale, I saw that on his IMDb. Uh, me and my daughter watched it, and it was cool uh, taking that trip down memory lane. So thank you, Neil. Don't forget, go to neilbook.com. And your homework is next week. you got to watch Gremlins 2. And don't forget to review, rate, share our podcast. Follow us on all social media, at Sequels Only. And don't forget to check out our website, sequelsonly.com. Good night.